Hi everyone, welcome back to Useful Genetics. This is Lecture 7C, where we're going to discuss sexual life cycles as a way of putting what we're going to learn about meiosis and mating into a functional organism level context. We'll talk about how ploidy changes, about when and where meiosis and mating happen, and how meiosis and mating together make new combinations of alleles. And in, we'll end with the sort of embarrassing admission that geneticists and evolutionary biologists really don't yet understand why recombination seems to be such a good thing. So first we can think about what do meiosis and mating accomplish? What's, what's the point of these processes? Because they're quite complex and life would be much simpler if we didn't have them. So mating accomplishes, mating is a term for process that leads to the fusion of two haploid cells, typically an egg and a sperm. So this is mating. And it takes two haploid cells with N chromosomes, and they fuse to form a diploid cell with two N chromosomes. This then, in organisms such as ourselves and almost all plants and animals, which are diploid, this diploid cell then undergoes many, many mitotic cycles developing into the mature organism. And eventually that mature organism, the cells in their germline undergo meiosis, process which takes the diploid cells to N and produces from them haploid cells, N, with different combinations of alleles. And we'll talk about the different combinations quite a lot in the next few lectures. And then it happens again. The haploid cells are the gametes. They fuse together, forming the diploid cell which forms the new organism, which in turn has cells that undergo meiosis, producing new haploid cells. Without both of these processes, meiosis and mating, there couldn't be any sexual reproduction. If we only had mitosis, well, genomes would get smaller and smaller. If we only had mating, our genome would double in size with every generation. We need the two reciprocal processes together to keep our chromosome numbers constant. But meiosis and mating aren't just a way to keep our chromosome numbers constant. Meiosis in particular isn't just a reductive version of mitosis taking us back to the haploid numbers that we had before mating. Meiosis also makes new combinations of chromosomes and of the sequences within chromosomes. And this is thought to be the real function of sexual reproduction. So here we have two haploid cells. They have four chromosomes each, so we can write N equals four. And they're going to mate to produce a diploid cell with two N equals eight. So this cell and this cell are fusing producing the diploid cell. This cell is then going to undergo mitotic divisions, turning into an organism that will produce haploid cells again. And the key point here, so these aren't products of the same meiosis. These are independent products of different meioses. The key point here is that the diploid cell has a combination of chromosomes that wasn't present in either of the haploid cells. And the next generation of haploid cells have different combinations of chromosomes. They've still each got a complete set, but they've got different combinations than each other and different combinations than were present in either of the original haploid cells that they came from. And again, when mating happens again, these cells are going to fuse with another cell, again generating a diploid cell, 2N, with a new combination of chromosomes that didn't exist before. And when this cell undergoes meiosis, yes, we're going to get more new combinations of chromosomes. 
And it's easy to do the math and see how many different combinations are possible given the different chromosomes that have been put into this process. This slide shows the same process, but from a more human-centered, personal kind of perspective. And it's like ones that you saw in Module 1. So here are the chromosomes that your mother has. She's got, we're pretending there's only five chromosomes in a diploid set, in a haploid set in humans, because otherwise the diagrams are too complicated. But she has a set of chromosomes from her mother, your maternal grandmother, and a set from her father. Similarly with your dad, he's diploid, he's got two complete sets, one from your paternal grandmother, one from your paternal grandfather. When your mother undergoes meiosis, what she gives you in her egg is a new combination of these two sets, one single set with a new combination of chromosomes. The same with the set of chromosomes that you get from your dad in the sperm. They're a new combination of the chromosomes he got from his mother and his father. And this is ma mating here. Now there's the diploid cell that's going to become you. When you eventually undergo meiosis, your germline cells undergo meiosis, again, a new combination of these chromosomes is created so that each of your gametes, your eggs or your sperm, gets a new different combination of the chromosomes that you got from both parents. Still a complete set, but a different combination. And when you have children, your partner will bring in new combinations of their sets as well. Now, meiosis doesn't only make new combinations of sets of chromosomes. It makes new combinations of the sequences within chromosomes as well. So if we simplify our picture and now only consider one chromosome, and we could say it was human chromosome 8, again in your mother and in your father, when she passes a chromosome onto you, it's not the single solid color chromosome that we showed in the last figure. Instead, the chromosome that she gives you is a combination of sequences from both of her versions of chromosome 8. And we can illustrate that by drawing places where events called crossovers will have occurred so that the chromosome that you inherited from her has information from the chromosome she got from her dad, the chromosome she got from her mom, more information from her dad's chromosome, and then more information from her mom's chromosome. Similarly, the chromosome that you get from your father has a combination of information that he got from your two paternal grandparents. Here, then maternal sequence, then paternal, then maternal. So each of the chromosomes you inherit is itself a new combination of alleles from your grandparents. And again, when you undergo meiosis, your two versions of chromosome 8 are again going to undergo crossing over in some new positions. I don't know where the positions happen by chance, but that means that each of the gametes, each of the chromosome 8 that you put in your gametes is going to have a different combination of the sequences that you inherited from your mother and from your father, and the same for your partner. So this diagram is to give you an outline of where the bulk of the lectures in this module are going. So in lectures 7D, E and F, and then 7H, we'll be introducing material mainly about how meiosis happens and the mechanistic underpinnings of what makes it work. And in lecture 7G and I, we'll have sets of problems in which you're asked to predict the genotypes of gametes that meiosis produces. 
Then, in lectures 7J and 7K, we'll talk about how mating happens, how to think about mating, how to figure, predict what's going to happen in mating, and then there'll be a bunch more problems to solidify those concepts. And then, at the end, we're going to think about ancestry and um, haplotypes a bit more, um, filling in details of stuff that we touched on in Module 6. Now, I've left to last the perplexing question of why do we do this? Why did natural selection favor sexual reproduction so that almost all eukaryote organisms, almost all single-celled eukaryotes, almost all plants, and almost all animals reproduce sexually by a cycle of mating and meiosis? Evolutionary biologists are pretty sure that this must be because it's good in an evolutionary sense that there's a selective advantage to randomizing the combinations of alleles that we pass on to our children, to not giving them the same intact sets that we got, but giving them new combinations. But the rather embarrassing truth is that evolutionary biologists don't know why this should be the case. We have not been able to come up with a thoroughly convincing explanation of why would it be good to randomize the combinations of alleles. There's certainly plenty of suggestions, and I've drawn some of them on this chalkboard here, but there's really no agreement about which explanations are right. So that makes this one of the great fundamental unsolved problems in evolutionary biology. So we've considered how meiosis is an essential step in the life cycle of sexually reproducing organisms. We need meiosis as the reductive division and then mating as the um, process that restores diploid genotypes. But meiosis doesn't just reduce the number of chromosomes. It makes new combinations of chromosomes, but also within each chromosome, we have new combinations of sequences. So even the idea of new combinations of chromosomes doesn't really, that's not really what happens. Instead, each of the chromosomes that we get is a new combination of sequences from both parents. And finally, the embarrassing truth that we don't know why sexual reproduction evolved, but it's clear that natural selection thinks that it is very important indeed. Now, coming up next, we're going to move into thinking about meiosis and we're going to take a very functional approach. What's the job that meiosis has to do? What are the problems it has to solve? And how does it solve them? I hope to see you there.